In video 21a, we'll go over concepts and definitions about the molecular structure and properties of strain hardening materials. An elastomer is a material that undergoes a large elastic deformation. So a strain hardening elastomer undergoes a large deformation that is, has high strains in which the tangent Young's modulus increases with stress. That is, the slope of the stress strain curve has an upward curvature. This often arises from hydrogels because hydrogels are made up of polymers that are hydrophilic and they soak up water that interrupts the van der Waals interactions that would otherwise stabilize the deformed structures. So instead of making van der Waals solids, they make up these very soft hydrogels that can move around a lot elastically. Now crosslinks in these materials between the polymers create nodes. Without the crosslinks, it would basically be a very viscous fluid. And that means that the elastic polymer region between crosslinks, so we have crosslink materials, and anywhere we have a polymer between the crosslinks, that makes up the bonds that determines the material properties. And we'll spend much of this uh, lecture 21 talking about the properties of those elastic bonds. We often refer to the stress strain curve as J-shape for biological materials because there's this flat toe region followed by an upward curve kind of like a J. The functional advantage of strain hardening materials is it allows large deformations within this region that we might refer to as the functional range where we don't exceed the allowable strain. But as we start to have excess stress beyond that, we only have minimal amounts of strain. This is especially important in things like pressure vessels that would, with excess strain, explode as we learned in that thing. Therefore, or in that unit, therefore, a lot of biological materials such as cell walls or arterial walls that make up um, things that will make pressure vessels, but also really anywhere you want to prevent excess deformation or even simply to allow large strains because it's difficult to maintain that linearity over large time. This strain hardening is often a natural function of the material property. So other examples are rubbers, the elastin networks in our skin, in fact, and scaffolds that may be used in tissue engineering made up of either elastin or collagen. There's three main molecular structures that make up strain hardening elastomers. The first is one that we talked about when we discussed arteries, and that's that there's multiple fiber types in the material. So here in purple, we see buckled collagen, and then in the, the brown, we see this very folded up, very soft elastin. So as we stretch the material over a smaller, relatively small, well, large, because it's elastomeric, but not too large strain, these buckled collagen fibers straighten, which doesn't take any force. In fact, they actually have lower energy straightened, but you're having to stretch the elastin to get there. Now, that's fairly soft. It doesn't take much to stretch elastin. But once those collagen fibers are fully extended, the only way to stretch farther is to stretch them, or once they're fully straightened. You can't straighten them anymore. Now you need to stretch them, and that then creates a very stiff region. So these tend to be characterized by a, by a, very, sharp, uh, a very sharp switch between the soft and the stiff material, making up the or fiber, making up these materials. A second cause of strain hardening elastomers is fiber reorientation. So here, whether you have a random orientation of fibers or a very regular reorientation of fibers, when you first stretch them in some way, as we show here, the first thing is that these fibers can reorient. And so without the individual fiber stretching, just by changing the angles between the nodes, a significant amount of elongation may be allowed. But once they're fully aligned, just like those collagen fibers in the previous example, the only way to stretch the material is to stretch the actual fibers. 
So they're soft while you're reorienting fibers and stiff while you're stretching fibers. The third cause of strain hardening materials are that the fibers within the material themselves may be strain hardening. And this generally arises from something called entropic springs. Recall that entropy is a measure of disorder and that molecules will want to go to the low energy state, which means the high entropy state. So if you have a very flexible fiber that is so flexible it can curl up like string, it really doesn't matter what conformation, you don't have to bend it to curl it up, then it will like to curl up because that's a very high entropy state. There's an enormous number of states that will cause the end-to-end -end length shown here in green, or shown here by this connection now in blue between the two, large number of conformations that cause that short end-to-end -end length, thus high entropy, thus low energy, whereas lower entropy, lower number of conformations that will cause a longer end-to-end -end length until eventually, if it's fully extended, there's only one conformation, meaning very low entropy, very high energy. So this is the concept of entropic springs, is that these flexible fibers just want to curl up to reduce entropy. All other things the same. We consider two models for entropic springs. The freely jointed train model is an idealized polymer in which we have discrete subunits like you see down here. So there may be things that are fairly rigid, but the angles between subunits are random. They don't care what angle they'll take on, so these will fold up. You can imagine this like a chain of paper clips, that even though the material inside it is rigid, these very flexible joints mean that it doesn't care what shape it takes. And so then again, the folded up shape has the higher entropy and thus the lower energy and is preferred. The other, oh, and, and this can model all sorts of polypep polymer change, like unfolded polypeptides, unbranched polysaccharide chains, single chain stranded RNA or DNA, or artificially made polymers like polyethylene glycol, which is a, a component of many biomaterials. The second model is the worm like chain model, or WLC. In this case, there's the idealized fibers that bend easily, which we see down here. So we don't see the sharp kinks. That they're, instead, they're uniform. Um, but again, just like string, they'll bend up really easily. They don't really care if they're straight or bent. So actin filaments and microtubules, if you get them long enough, will, are very bendy like this, as are DNA double helices. So a DNA double helix wants to be straight. But these are very tightly curled up in our cells, allowing that enormous length of DNA to be in one cell. Of course, in our cell, they're also packed together by things like histones. But if we didn't do that, they would be a goobly gook, snarled up, curly string. That is, a worm-like chain. So again, recall that chemical systems seek the lowest energy. Gibbs free energy is the enthalpy, that is, referring to the bending energy, minus the temperature times the entropy, which is related to the disorder, the number of conformations that can still give the same length. Because force is the derivative of the energy landscape, this also means that as these go to higher energy when they get longer, they're also, it takes force in order to get them to that higher energy state. So under no tension, they're balled up, medium tension, they're somewhat elongated, and it would take extremely high tension to get to the lowest energy state completely unfolded. Oh, in the next video, we'll talk about the mathematical descriptions of worm-like chains.